coming in March from the VLGA is the first 2024 session in the highly regarded Fast Track series, looking at the critical issue of leading under pressure. Fast Track is targeted professional development for mayors and councillors, dealing with the topical and timely issues of our time. Speakers and registration details will be announced soon. Get ready to fast track your way to the 2024 elections with the VLGA. Hello, Chris Eddy here with the Local Government News Roundup and on the podcast today, shock and disappointment across regional Victoria as its hosting of the 2026 Commonwealth Games is scrapped. I'll have a roundup of all the reaction to yesterday's announcement. Reaction also to sweeping new reforms to tackle gambling harm. Tasmania's government takes forced amalgamations off the table and then announces a surprise move to remove some planning powers from councils. A twist in the countback process to fill a vacancy at Strathbogie Council. Irresponsible dog owners in the sites of government and councils in Queensland. And shocking new statistics about disposable vape usage leads councils to call for a ban in the UK. That's all ahead on this latest update from the Local Government News Roundup. It's good to have you with us for the Roundup today, wherever you're listening, across Australia or around the world. Our podcast is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, your councillor support network, and by SnapSend Solve, in the business of keeping shared spaces safe, clean and great to be in. The big story this week is Victoria's withdrawal from hosting the 2026 Commonwealth Games. Premier Daniel Andrews made the shock announcement on Tuesday, saying the escalating cost of staging the Games in regional Victoria could not be justified. He said instead of the original budget of $2.6 billion, it was now looking more likely that the 12-day event could cost around $6 or $7 billion. A regional spending package was announced to replace the Games funding, with $1 billion to be dedicated to building 1,300 new homes across regional Victoria. The sporting facilities promised for the Games would also still be built, including upgrades to the Eureka Stadium in Ballarat and the Bendigo Stadium and BMX facilities in Shepparton. Geelong will get a new indoor sporting complex at Warren Ponds and a new aquatic centre in Armstrong Creek, plus other facility improvements. And in Gippsland, the regional indoor sports stadium in Taralgon will be refurbished, along with the Ted Summerton Reserve in Mowie and a new shotgun trap shooting range at Morwell. Councils around the state took some time yesterday to digest the announcement and its implications before responding publicly. Today's Bendigo advertiser describes the shock at Greater Bendigo Council, with the Mayor Andrea Metcalf finding out around the same time media reports were beginning to circulate. Acting CEO and Games Director Andrew Cooney told the paper that the Council would never apologise for its excitement and hope for the Games, despite the challenging timelines. Greater Shepparton's Mayor Shane Sarley said he was extremely disappointed as the region was gearing up for the Games and looking forward to a legacy economic boost from the thousands of expected visitors. He said there is an expectation for further funding beyond that already announced for an upgrade to the Shepparton Sports and Events Stadium as well as a share of the $150 million Regional Tourism and Events Fund. The Mayor of Latrobe, Kelly O'Callaghan, told The Guardian that the cancellation was a pretty big announcement and a significant disappointment for the local community. She had been concerned that a lack of additional funding in the state budget would have added pressure on being able to deliver Latrobe's part of the Games. In Greater Geelong, Mayor Trent Sullivan described the cancellation as very disappointing. He said the council was eagerly awaiting the details of exactly what infrastructure would be funded and delivered. Mayor Sullivan said councils had entered into an arrangement with the state government in good faith and have invested time, resources and funds to help deliver a successful Games. The Roundup understands some councils outside of the main regional hubs have made project commitments on the basis of expected support and economic flow-ons from the Games. There's some doubt about the viability of some of those projects and those councils will be keen to discuss support or compensation arrangements with the government. 
The regional city's Victoria Advocacy Group is greatly disappointed at the loss of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to showcase regional Victoria to the world. Rural Councils Victoria welcomed the housing commitment in particular. Chair Marianne Brown said the group understood the fiscal constraints that prompted the decision to cancel the Games. And the MAV said it is cautiously optimistic about the replacement of regional funding packages for infrastructure and housing and that the $1 billion housing commitment in particular could have a real and positive impact on the lives of many regional Victorians. The Victorian opposition labelled the news as a massive humiliation for the state and a betrayal of regional Victoria. While the cancellation has been criticised by current and former athletes, the head of Commonwealth Games Australia, Craig Phillips, told The Guardian that it would cost Melbourne its reputation as a sports-friendly city. The Commonwealth Games Federation said it was given eight hours' notice of the decision and while hugely disappointed, it is committed to finding another host for the 2026 event. Another significant state government announcement has been somewhat overshadowed by the Commonwealth Games cancellation. Sweeping new reforms to address harm from gambling were announced on Sunday, and they've been roundly welcomed by councils which have been calling for this type of action for some time. The MAV said it strongly endorsed the introduction of mandatory pre-commitment schemes and closure periods, and hope to see that brought into effect as soon as possible. It said there's more to be done around online gambling, advertising and reducing the prevalence of gambling venues in communities, and that it was looking forward to seeing the detail on the first suite of reforms. Manningham Mayor Deidre Diamenti welcomed the measures, saying the council had been advocating for poker machine reform, and Hume City Council said it was a major win for communities around Victoria. Its Mayor Joseph Hawil has spearheaded a campaign involving seven councils to lobby for state-mandated regulation of the gaming industry. He said the announcement was proof of the power of strong, united voices in an issue that affects the entire country. There's been a surprise development with the filling of the extraordinary vacancy at Strathbogie Shire's Lake Nagambi Ward. A count back last week of the two remaining candidates from the 2020 election resulted in the election of Paul Ayton. However, Mr Ayton presumably chose to not take up the position, resulting in an announcement on Monday by the VEC that Robin Weatherald had been elected as the only eligible candidate remaining. Mr Weatherald has accepted the position. The VEC said if another vacancy in that ward was to occur before the 2024 elections, a by-election would need to be held. In today's Victorian Briefs, Mitchell Shire Council has revealed the cost of dealing with illegal rubbish dumping. The North Central Review reports the council has spent $1.4 million over five years collecting and investigating illegally dumped rubbish. More than 400 incidents were managed during the 2021-22 financial year at a cost of more than $160,000. La Trobe City Council is celebrating a win at the Aquatic and Recreation Victoria Industry Awards. An exercise and cancer pilot project at La Trobe Leisure has been recognised with the Community Impact Award. The pilot project was designed to address the needs and challenges for people undergoing cancer treatment or in post-treatment recovery. And Greater Geelong City Council will host a series of community conversation forums on the Voice to Parliament. The free forums are described as an informal chance to listen and learn about the referendum. There are three forums still to come between the 27th of July and the 21st of August. Deputy Mayor Anthony Aitken encouraged people to attend and participate in respectful conversations about the Voice. Ahead of the national roundup, some Victorian councils in the news this week. Warrnambool City Council has been fined $12,500 plus costs in the local magistrate's court after pleading guilty to failing to ensure persons were not exposed to risks at the Warrnambool sale yards. The case related to the collapse of a walkway during an auction in 2020. According to the Warrnambool Standard, the magistrate found the council's inspection regime to be completely inadequate. No one was seriously injured in the incident. The Border Mail reports that Wodonga Council will press its case to not have single-member wards with the local government minister. The council has voted unanimously this week to ask the minister to use her power to specify that the municipality be unsubdivided and reject the proposed seven-single-member ward structure.
And The Age has reported on Darabin Council's opposition to a 15-storey tower and supermarket development. The council's stand has been criticised by government and opposition MPs who say it is standing in the way of more social and affordable housing. The proposal is recommended for fast-track assessment by the state government, which would see it skip normal council planning processes. You're listening to the Local Government News Roundup with Chris Eddy. Now, let's head around Australia with our national roundup starting in Tasmania. The state government there will not force councils to amalgamate, regardless of the outcome of the current local government review board process. Premier Jeremy Rockliffe has moved to quell growing disquiet amongst smaller councils by declaring that the review would not result in forced amalgamations. He said he wanted to end fear and uncertainty by making it clear that councils will make their own decisions on potential amalgamations. Local Government Minister Nick Street said that councils would be invited to review the board's report, which is due for release on the 31st of October, and make a submission to the government about their preferences. The announcement has been welcomed by the sector. LGAT President Mick Tucker, who is also the Mayor of Breakaday Council, said it cleared the way for coming up with some real positives from the review process. In the wake of the government's announcement, Sue Smith, the chair of the board undertaking the review, said rather than looking at ways to push together or amalgamate existing councils, she wanted to see councils help identify how local government areas might evolve, develop and shift to better reflect 21st century communities. Meanwhile, there's been another state government announcement affecting councils in Tasmania this week. Premier Jeremy Rockliffe yesterday announced a plan to legislate to take the politics out of planning by creating independent development assessment panels, taking the responsibility away from councils. The Premier said too many ideologically motivated party-aligned councillors were holding up critical development projects. In today's Launceston Examiner, LGAT President Mick Tucker said he was gobsmacked and blindsided by the move that has come out of left field without any consultation with councils. I suspect that won't be the last we hear on that front. Now to New South Wales and the Mayor of Lismore has called for a locally led approach to flood recovery management. Steve Krieg told the ABC the Sydney-centric model is not working and is embarrassing. He said some 17 months after the February 2022 flood, private sector rebuilding was outpacing government efforts. Lismore Council wants a Queensland-style model where local disaster management groups lead the process. Mayor Krieg has criticised the Northern Rivers Reconstruction Corporation's approach, with fewer than 2% of targeted home buybacks settled so far. Waverley Council in Sydney's eastern suburbs is being accused of overreaching as new planning conditions come into effect, banning the installation of gas stoves and ovens and gas heating in new residential developments. The Daily Telegraph reports that new developments in Waverley must have electric heating and cooling. The council says it will improve indoor air quality and help it reach a target of net zero emissions by 2035. Critics question whether it will lead to lower emissions and have described it as virtue signalling and an example of massive government overreach. In Queensland, LGAQ says communities there are being held to ransom by irresponsible dog owners dragging out appeals through the courts. The peak body says it has cost one council more than $1 million to keep a dog in the pound and pay for court and legal costs. CEO Alison Smith says it's unfair that ratepayers are paying when most dog owners do the right thing. She welcomed moves by the state government to get tough with irresponsible owners. Meanwhile, Gold Coast City Council is set to consider some of the toughest penalties for irresponsible dog owners. A proposal from the city's governance committee will go before the council next week and could see owners fined $619 for failing to keep a dog under control. Nine News said the proposal follows several incidents this year in the city in which people have been mauled by dogs, including a toddler rushed to hospital with serious head and neck injuries. And across to WA, where the city of Coburn is seeking support from the Minister for Planning for an update to its town planning scheme that would provide more protection for the city's significant trees. There are 27 individual listings on the city's significant tree list considered to be of landmark value. 
The council has endorsed scheme amendments to provide stronger protections for the trees, including the ability to impose an emergency order where there's an imminent risk of damage to a specific tree. The move follows endorsement by the WA Local Government Association of a new urban forest advocacy position of a minimum tree canopy target of 30% by 2040 for the Perth and Peel regions. To the national briefs, nominations have opened for the New South Wales Minister's Awards for Women in Local Government. There are six categories for the awards now in their 16th year. Winners will be announced at a ceremony in October. Mayors, councillors and CEOs from across rural, remote and regional Queensland will converge on Gundawindi next week for the LGAQ Bush Council's convention. Topics on the agenda for the three-day event include disaster management, housing and tourism. And the city of Stirling has launched a first for Western Australia, an AI-supported engagement platform to gather direct feedback at local parks, playgrounds and community centres. The system, called Ainsley, will enable automated two-way conversations with residents, accessed by text message or QR codes at 42 locations around the city. Ainsley will be used to inform the city's new community infrastructure plan. Now on the Local Government News Roundup, it's time for the International Spotlight. We're going to start with a couple of stories out of the US firstly today. A council in Massachusetts has called on the city's police department to stop policing cyclists who travel through a red light. Somerville City Council says despite a state law that requires cyclists to stop at red lights and stop signs, they should be allowed to travel through a red light as long as they give way to pedestrians or vehicles. 198 cyclists have received a written warning from police since June when they received a state enforcement grant. The council's position is merely a recommendation and it has no power to override the state law. The Boston Herald reports there are eight states in the US that do allow cyclists to go through red lights and stop signs in special circumstances. In Oregon, a council's mayor and two other elected members are facing recall efforts with petitions filed this week. The petitioners looking to unseat Mayor Ron Hedenskog of Brookings City Council say one reason is that the local government is not listening to its constituents. According to KLCC Public Radio, another factor leading to the recall efforts was a decision in January to reinstate the city manager who had been caught shoplifting last year and placed on paid administrative leave. The leaders of the recall efforts will have 90 days to gather more than 400 voter signatures on each petition, which would then lead to a special election for approval. From the UK, an update from Woking Borough Council in Surrey, which recently ceased all non-essential spending with debts forecast to reach £2.6 billion. In the latest development, 350 members of staff have been put on notice of redundancy as the council undergoes a full restructure and downsizing. The BBC reports that the equivalent of 60 full-time jobs are expected to be lost as part of the process. Local councils in England and Wales are calling for a total ban on disposable vapes by 2024 due to concerns about litter, fire hazards and their appeal to children. The Local Government Association says 1.3 million disposable vapes are thrown away each week. Single-use vapes are often brightly packaged and offer a few hundred puffs of nicotine-containing vapour with added flavours. Unlike conventional vapes that can be refilled, disposable vapes are discarded when empty. They also contain a small lithium battery that can pose a fire risk when crushed in bin lorries. The BBC reports research that suggests the issue may be even larger than reported, with nearly 300 million e-cigarettes, including disposables, sold in the UK in the past year. One UK council this week has reported that it's discovered a number of retailers selling disposable vapes to under-18s in breach of the law. Cumberland Council says it's investigating after undercover test purchases found three out of eight shops selling the e-cigarettes to minors. This comes as a meeting of Lancashire County Council was last week told that one in six teens were now regular vapours, including kids as young as eight years of age. The Daily Mail reports that councillors have slammed the unscrupulous businesses that sell brightly coloured and fruity vapes to children for pocket money prices. 
And in Hong Kong, where smoking is banned, the Health Secretary has this week asked people to help discourage the practice by staring at individuals who light up where they shouldn't. He said staring at smokers in non-smoking areas could serve as a form of social pressure. The city is looking at stricter anti-smoking measures, including banning tobacco sales to individuals born after a certain year and increasing cigarette taxes. Well, that's been a jam-packed edition of The Roundup. If you'd like to follow up on any of those stories, all of the links are in the transcript, which you'll find on our website. The Local Government News Roundup is brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from SnapSend Solve. And don't forget the lunchtime webinar on the 20th of July with SnapSend Solve and the City of Swan showcasing the two-way integration that is helping to improve customer satisfaction at the city. Details on our website where you'll also learn how you can support the Roundup by becoming a subscriber through a small monthly contribution which you can cancel at any time. Subscribers now have access to the July edition of our interview special, Council Conversations. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. More of the latest local government news coming away soon. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now. Coming in March from the VLGA is the first 2024 session in the highly regarded Fast Track series, looking at the critical issue of leading under pressure. Fast Track is targeted professional development for mayors and councillors, dealing with the topical and timely issues of our time. Speakers and registration details will be announced soon. Get ready to fast track your way to the 2024 elections with the VLGA.